Good afternoon, everyone. I, I know you can hear me in the back because uh, I can hear me in the front. Uh, but welcome to the uh, lecture series uh, here, the first of the um, lectures that Cecile Fromont will be giving um, in this, the Center for African Studies at Harvard. Uh, Cecile earned her PhD in the History of Art and Architecture Department um, here at Harvard. I'll tell you a little bit more about her as a student toward the end of this introduction. Uh, and prior to that, she her earned her diploma from Sciences Po in Paris. Um, her essays have appeared in a wide variety of journals on various issues of African and Latin American art, uh, including African arts, res, anthropology, uh, and aesthetics, colonial Latin American review, and others, uh, a wide variety of edited volumes, exhibition catalogs, et cetera. She's had uh, an array of really important fellowships from the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, the Michigan Society for Fellows, the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board Grant, and Yale Institute for Sacred Music. She is now associate professor uh, at Yale University in the History of Art department there, the Art History Department there. Uh, and she's also been a fellow for the 2017-18 academic year uh, at the American Academy in Rome uh, as a prize fellow. One of the most staggering things about uh, Cecile is not only uh, her wonderful scholarship, but also how at a very young um, age academically, her first book just um, arrived on the scene and just received a series of incredibly important honors, which speaks to, in my uh, um, view, not only the importance of this topic and her incredible scholarship, but how she forges critical paths through new kinds of interventions and approaches to um, the material. And this is her first book called The Art of Conversion, Christian Visual Culture in the Kingdom of Congo, which is doubly footed, if one could say, both in the history of Congo and uh, in the history of Italy. In fact, her first position at the University of Chicago was as an, in the, uh, as an early modern art uh, scholar rather than as, let's say, an African art scholar per se. Uh, and it uh, received the College Art Association's Millard Meese Publication Fund Grant. It was named uh, the American Academy of Religions 2015 Best First Book in the History of Religions. <coughs> She received the, uh, it received the 2015 Albert uh, Rabateau Book Prize for the best book in Africana religions, and the 2017 Arnold Rubin Outstanding Publish Publication Award from the Arts Council of the African Studies Association, which is given once every three years. And it was an honorable mention for the Melville J. Herskovitz Award. Um, it is truly a path-forging book um, situated not only between Congo, uh, Italy, Europe, and Africa, but also between uh, and um, transforming in many respects the scholarship of both the history of religion uh, and the history of art. Her articles include a wide variety of really interesting works which speak to her, um, the richness of her engagement and the transformative ways in which geographically and through other uh, venues she's approaching her subjects from Becoming the Black Rome, Africa and the African Atlantic, which was in a publication called Ache Bahia, The Power of Art in the African Brazilian Metropolis. Uh, another work on foreign cloth, local habits, clothing, regalia and the art of conversion in the early modern kingdom of Congo, and uh, dancing for the king of Congo, the early modern Central Africa, uh, from early modern Central Africa to slavery era uh, Brazil. Uh, and I'll mention just two more. Under the Sign of the Cross in the Kingdom of Congo, Religious Conversion and Visual Correlation in Early Modern Central Africa, and Collecting and Translating Knowledge Across Cultures, Capuchin Missionary Images of Early Modern Central Africa. 
now to her as a student, which one barely gets uh, to do. Um, all I can say is the moment that she walked into the classrooms, uh, uh, which was then the Sackler Museum, um, she had such presence, such capacity, such um, really intelligence across so many different ways of approaching the, su the subject. She's incredibly gifted at languages, and I think that that speaks in part to the array of approaches that she's bringing and her unique uh, ability to really transcend the archival materials in ways that very few of us have the ability to do. Um, I think that her approach to the archives, particularly in the field of uh, African art, is absolutely stunning. We as a field have been um, particularly focused uh, on work sort of on the ground in Africa as opposed to exploring simultaneously how those rich traditions are being complemented in what is um, happening within the archives. Uh, in this case, in Europe, Brazil, and elsewhere. The fact that she considers as her home for scholarship, Africa, the Americas, and Europe, I also think speaks volumes about not only her enormous capacity, uh, but also the ways in which she is able to bring these incredibly rich and important traditions together in an historical manner in ways that enrich all three. And finally, I would say that she has an incredible skill with narrative of bringing these traditions and these ideas to the forefront in a way that make them simultaneously, I would say, profound uh, and accessible, something which is, I think, incredibly important for us as scholars. I can't tell you how excited I am to uh, hear this particular series of talks for the um, Richard Cohen series, in this case, uh, Amulets and Agencies. So let's welcome Cécile Fromont. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. Well, I'm more nervous now than before you spoke. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you very much to everybody. I'm so <laughs> grateful and honored to be here tonight in your presence. I, uh, of course, want to thank Skip for inviting me uh, to give uh, those lectures. This all started in Angola when we were um, sitting in Luanda uh, during one long day. Uh, and I hope I can uh, bring some of the energy of that day uh, to our time together this week. Um, thank you, of course, to uh, Richard Cohen and the Hutchins Center for African and African American Research for making this event uh, possible. So I began um, the research for these lectures years ago at a time of mourning for the passing of so many elders in my family. And I finished writing them, as it uh, turned out, in the last few months, in the days of taking care of a newborn. That generations pass and memory fade often shocked my spirits as I stared at lives captured in ink manuscripts, appearing in shadows against the backlight of microphone, microphone readers, and as I touched what others had touched hundreds of years ago. Losing lives and giving life, I learned that what is fleeting need not be lost. In the archived, but also in the unarchived, unbroken ties threaded through oblivion link ancestors to descendants. And so, in memory of that, I brought today a light and some rum. And it's an LED light because the ancestors are keeping up with the times and they're very worried about fire safety, actually, and uh, carbon footprints. I'll put it here. And they're asking, what are we doing here about that? Um, and I uh, pay respect to the ancestors of the Mashpi Wampunoag, Aquina Monponoag, Nipmuk, and Massachusetts nations. And I acknowledge in gratitude their people's enduring stewardship, past, present, and future, of the land on which we stand. I acknowledge in gratitude and respect the men and women whose enslaved or misappropriated labor contributed to building the institution within which we meet today. An institution from which I benefited as a student and continue to benefit as a scholar.
I also stand in awe and respect of all the ancestors who crossed the waters of the Atlantic in literal or metaphorical chains and contributed to make our world that which we know today. In our time together over the next few days, we will invoke the memory of a small number of his ancestors following the threads of their lives webbed in the cross currents of capture, deportation, and enslavement across the 18th century Atlantic world. We will trace their transoceanic embodied experiences and analyze the empowered objects they created from matters, symbols, and procedures drawn from the plural esoteric traditions they encountered along their journeys. We will witness the powers they derive from these objects and rituals and the counterpowers that European civil and religious authorities exerted upon them through their administrative and archival machineries, capturing bundles into archives and shackling bodies to pillory and pyre. Ultimately, these lives, bundles, powers, and archives will sketch for us across entangled African and European horizons, material and spiritual histories of the Afro-Atlantic. So let's begin. 1731, trial of José Francisco Pereira, black man, slave of João Francisco Pedroso, born in Ouida on the Mina coast and resident of this city of Lisbon. Tightly bound and stitched, duly labeled and dated, a 123-page inquisition trial record captured the story of José Francisco. The Holy Office of Lisbon detained the enslaved African man in the early summer of 1730 on charges of witchcraft for making and selling amulets. At the center of the inquiry was this set of ink on paper compositions that the tribunal seized from the men and duly archived in the pages documenting the proceedings. The sheets, now flattened between the pages of the trial record, still bear the traces of their original conception and use as three-dimensional objects. Creased from being once folded into small rectangles to fit into pouches similar to these. The pages contain a mix of drawings and alphabetic markings that Jose Francisco composed by enlisting the penmanship of a European youth. The pieces of paper were the key ingredient in the empowered packet the African man made and marketed a kind of object known in the 18th century Portuguese speaking world as bolsas de mandinga, or mandingo bag in a literal translation. The bolsas were the object par excellence of the 18th century Afro Portuguese Atlantic. They were most readily found in the urban nodes of Lisbon, Luanda, Salvador da Bahia, or Rio de Janeiro, but they also held power over the visible and invisible order or of even the most remote locations of the Portuguese uh, presence. They appeared in Madeira, in North Africa, and even in faraway India. Used by men and women of all ethnic and social classes, they were typically masterminded by specialists of African origins or descent trained in the Portuguese Atlantic through apprenticeship in the art of creating locating and assembling empowered materials into individualized objects or of either or both protection and action. Some of the bolsas assisted their owners in matrimonial, romantic or sexual pursuits. Others protected the enslaved against the abuse of their masters. Most, however, served as spectacularly efficient shields against physical vulnerability with a special ability to stop metal implements from penetrating the body. And we have numerous awestruck testimonies of Africans and Europeans alike, describing how knives, swords, and even bullets from firearms literally bounced off the skin of bolsa wearers. We know also that sellers of the pouches did not hesitate to vaunt and demonstrate the efficacy of their products, 
uh, one of, um, of the sellers um, with his manjinga around the neck um, leaped on top of a sword he had planted on the ground face up um, in the uh, plaza of Porto in Portugal in 1728 and did not impale himself. In another anecdote from 1714 in Angola, a potential user sued the skepticism when, after firing his gun several times on a dog wearing a manjinga around the neck, he saw the animal escape unscathed. The Portuguese Holy Office diligent record keeping and detailed inquiries have left us with an impressive archive about the conception use and efficacy of his empowered bundles. Yet the geography within which the pouches of Afro-Atlantic agency acted in the 18th century did not conform to any U European imperial lines. In fact, bundles masterminded by specialists of African origins or descent ruled over the spiritual landscape of many corners of the mature early modern Atlantic worlds. They operated in the Caribbean island that French colonizers called uh, Saint-Domingue. There. Um, and there they were uh, known under the name of Macandal or Gadko and as powerful shields and also redoubtable poisons that were in the hands of Africans uh, living in enslavement or in self-grasped freedom. Elsewhere, the Spanish Inquisition recorded them in today's Colombia, for instance, in the story of Antonio de Salinas, who was an enslaved black man and survived the blow of a cannonball fired to his chest in 1689, thanks to a bag containing herbs, sticks, images of saints, and manuscript prayers wrapped in textiles. Historiographic traditions determined by a focus on single European national languages or emphasis on the study of a single European imperial domain have often kept these objects from being considered side by side. Yet, the bundles took part in and indeed defined, I will argue tonight and in the next two days, a vast and varied but specific Afro-Atlantic geography with contours of its own and intrinsic inner workings. And this is a, a, a map that we're familiar with, with um, color-coded domains of different European uh, 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 colonial empires. But these kinds of records um, from Iberian Inquisition trials uh, on the left, or paperwork from the French colonial administration on the right, but also travelogues, have kept the mostly discreet, at time explosive, but consistently efficacious ways in which these bundles function still partly discernible. The pouches, accordingly, have attracted the attention of many historians, approaching them from a range of perspectives. These scholars all duly noted their cross-cultural dimension, made evident, they argued, by the itineraries of their makers across African, indigenous Americans, and European milieus. Yet their investigations often stumbled at the analysis of the connections of the bundle's visual and material contents to multiple cultural realms. In particular, the ostensibly European designs and materials of the bag's makeup give them pause. Some judge that the references that they made to multiple visual, religious, or symbolic sources were broad and vague and would remain elusive to firm identification, let alone interpretation. Others confronted the packets as thinly veiled syncretic versions of entirely African practices or as testaments of cultural retention through the Middle Passage and early, if still amorphous, roots of a yet to come after European, Afro Caribbean, or Afro Latin American culture. As an art historian, I want to argue, in contrast, that a close attention to the bundle's form, modes of creation, and uses, uh, 
does allow for a culturally and historically specific discussion of their sources, their modus operandi, and their impact. Attempts at tracing influences across the Middle Passage and drawing specific connections between the empowered pouches and pinpointed African precedents, I think misunderstand these eminently Atlantic objects of vast spiritual and material horizons. The bundles, I will argue in these lectures, belong to the time and space defined by the height of the Atlantic slave trade. Visual and material analysis set in the context of the 18th century transatlantic traffic in enslaved men and women not only shed light on the packets, but also reveals the deep and mutually transformative connections that transoceanic commerce created between European and African material and spiritual realms. Today, in the first lecture, I will demonstrate that the bundles were far from simple, stealthy objects from oppressed subjects hiding their gods behind the semblance of their masters. Rather, the pouches were the product of the sustained and intimate, if often abruptly asymmetrical dialogue that the Atlantic slave trade sparked and chattel slavery perpetrated between people along the two continents coast and beyond them in the Americas. The bundles were in fact one part of a broader complex of material processes aimed at manipulating insensible forces to sensible results, that is to say, exercising power. The agency African amulets exercise in the slavery era Circum Atlantic operated alongside and in close concert with the amuletic operations of European mechanisms of order and punishment. Our discussion will continue tomorrow when I will suggest that while packet makers' ability to call upon and rearticulate materials, rituals, and designs from a range of sources was indeed capacious, it was not vague, nor must it remain elusive. The case of two amulet makers whose lives followed parallel but distinct itineraries around the Atlantic world will give us religiously, culturally, and socially specific perspective on the material and spiritual alchemy thanks to which amulet owners and makers mobilized power and negotiated a place for themselves in slavery era Brazil, Portugal, and Saint-Domingue. Finally, in the third lecture, we will consider together how the empowered objects bear witness in their composition, use, and afterlives in the archive to the multivalent connections that the slave trade engendered between Europeans and Africans. They enjoin us to think anew about the spiritual and material histories of the Atlantic world as shared domains between the two continents and to consider the entangled trajectories of slave trade, witchcraft, and art. So let's take a close look at the Bolsas de Menjinga. As, uh, they appear in the archive. So the phrase Bolsa de Menjinga itself draws an etymological connection between the practice and the West African Mande speaking people, among which the Mandingo, Malinke, they are terms uh, that derive from local idioms for people of Mali or people of Mandan. However, by the time the Bolsas de Menjinga become widespread and specific as a practice in the late 17th and early 18th century in the Portuguese speaking world, neither makers nor users or even censors link the packet to that particular background. At that point, the word Menjinga itself, when used in conjunction to the Bolsas, was disconnected from ethnogeographic connotations. It expressed instead ideas of supernatural control and efficacy. So it appeared in phrases such as, this amulet worked, so it is Manjinga. The neologism Manjingero, in turn, um, came to designate a specialist in the crafting of the bolsas. The bolsas first appear in the historical record in the late 17th century. Historian James Sweet identified the story of Manuel, 
a slave who had resided in Madeira before coming to Lisbon and who faced denunciation to the Inquisition in 1672 uh, as the earliest accounts of Bosa's, although in that uh, account they are not named as Bosa's de Menjinga. The first trial to name them as Bosa's and as Menjinga's took place in the 1690s, and it was in the first decade of the 18th century that their mention in Inquisition documents really proliferated. Their use, or perhaps only their occurrence in the archive, peaked in the first half of the 18th century in the hands of black and white inhabitants of Portugal and its overseas territories and settlements. The surge in reports followed the publication in 1693 of an Inquisition decree that publicized the Bolsas as an area of interest for the Inquisition and also mandated their denunciation. So their increased visibility came from that decree, um, but ultimately the decree itself probably came uh, from uh, the increase in uh, the widespread use of the amulets. This period-specific dimension of the Bolsas as 18th century objects led historian Laura de Melo Souza to define them in the Brazilian context as quintessentially colonial objects. And I would extend her remark to consider them as objects molded in a mature Atlantic world, a world encompassing distant locales into a space of shared cultural manifestations created by and fostering the dynamic circulation of people, material, and ideas with the slave trade as a central driving force. And in fact, Africans became manjingueros along a multiple tap transoceanic journey during which they received training and knowledge from interlocutors of diverse backgrounds. Contemporary users of manjingas acutely identified this transregional trans dimension of the empowered packets. Clients in Lisbon, for example, specifically sought after ingredients and menjingueros that had just landed from Brazil. Several bolsas actually exist in the Inquisition archive. One, for instance, um, is in the record of uh, the inquest concerning Jacques Viegas from 1704, who was a slave from Mina, accused of sorcery and witchcraft, bruxaria e feitiçaria. Another, now in the uh, uh, delations of the Cadernos do Promotor, accompanied the 1749 denunciation in Funchal in Madeira of the widow Dona Francisca Maria de Menezes, who sought help from a bolsa, though one not explicitly named as Menjinga in the record, to find a new husband. Consistent with the numerous written descriptions of the object, the two bolsas are small packets encased and stitched in cloth. In the first case, on the left, the Mandinguero saw a, green, a greenish strip of plain textile around a piece of paper, and you can still see seeds and hair uh, sticking out uh, of the pouch. The second packet here hangs on a string uh, attached to a piece of crimson and blue cloth stitched with light color um, cord around a folded piece of paper. And when you open it up, the sheet holds in its folds some pebbles. Uh, here you can see the pebbles there, and in the middle is a, a zoom of that part. And these papers, uh, pebbles are probably um, pieces of uh, grinded altar stones, which is one of the ingredients of this particular bolsa. The paper also contains a set of Latin prayer phrases interspersed with crosses and is topped by a circle containing a Latin cross in the position of a header in the top left um, there. Scribbled letters complete the design, evidently inspired by religious medals in general, and I think specifically Vintain coins, such as the one in the middle, which were broadly used as amulets um, in Portugal. And, um, that's why it's pierced to be worn around the neck. 
We know also of the bolsas from watercolors by uh, Italian-born Portuguese army officer and painter Carlos Julian or Carlo Giuliani, um, who illustrated the bolsas as worn in Brazil by a full range of people in the last quarter of the 18th century. Here, a black woman fruit seller protects herself and her child with a range of devices, a pentagram tattoo on her hand, possibly a vintage amulet around the neck, medals and pendants at the waist, and what is likely a manjinga on her chest. These images not only seize the use of the bolsas, but also provide a sense of the high incidence of the practice that, though discussed by only a few Inquisition documents, appear in many of the painted daily, daily life scenes. The genre images on the screen depict both square-shaped pouches similar to Dona Francisca's and more amorphous ones reminiscent of Jacques Viega's. Of course, every pouch um, pictured and worn around the body was not menjinga. Some bags were utilitarian. There were tobacco pouches, pouches or um, per coin purses. Um, and other pendants functioned as amulets outside of the realm of menjinga. The square-shaped bags as seen on the chest of many of Julian's figures, for example, could as easily be Catholic scapulars as bolsas de menjinga, particularly when juxtaposed to rosaries. Yet the ambiguity of the object Julian and other artists depicted is not only a matter of retrospective interpretation. This ambivalent look was key to the quiet but potentially subversive use of the bolsas as tool of protection and empowerment by the enslaved or otherwise vulnerable in the era of slavery. The same ambiguity also allowed the members of the elite to turn a blind eye to the notorious presence of the bags when they could pretend not to recognize them uh, when worn by their slaves and could pass them as orthodox features when finding themselves in need of the object's support. In fact, the denunciation regarding Dona Francisca, who was a, a white woman, um, makes explicit the fluidity between orthodox and sacrilegious empowered object. The text not only refers to the bolsas as a bencino or a scapular, but also explains how Catholic bencinios served as containers for empowered and orthodox ingredient routinely. This association between bolsas and scapulars was in fact multivalent. The imagery of the Virgin in South America during the colonial era left many examples of the fluid connections between the Holy Woman, amuletic packets, and numinous agency. For example, Our Lady of Mercy for the Redemption of Captive, associated in Iberia with the liberation of Christians caught in North Africa, became popular in the Americas among Africans and mulattoes, free or enslaved, but in all cases, captives in their own right of the slave, slave system. Her iconography, holding shackles in one hand and scapulars in the other, offered a potent visual connection between empowered packets and ideas of protection against the violence of the slave systems, real or metaphorical chains. So uh, I brought three examples of um, Our Lady of Mercy uh, to the left in Lima with dainty shackles on the left and um, the pouch on the right. Uh, here from Brazil, Minas Gerais, uh, more substantial shackles uh, there with the scapulars. Um, and here on the facade of a church in Minas Gerais uh, with a coat extended, no scapular in her hand, but uh, breaking up the chains um, nonetheless um, there. Popular ex votos, paintings thanking the Virgin for intervention in favor of devotees, also pictured the empowered bundles and the prominent place they held in the imaginary of supernatural intervention, uh, in this case in 18th century Brazil. Raised high in the hand of the Virgin and the Child Christ in the miraculous moments, scapulars, cum bundles, declared themselves as the material intercessors 
through which the powers of the holy woman um, were channels and took effect in the visible worlds. Similar in form, makeup, and use, bolsas and scapulars functioned simultaneously within a shared realm of beliefs in and recourse to supernatural intervention. So these little dots there are the scapulars being held or the pouches. This ambivalence reflects the complex nature of Mandinga's social character. The pouches were both highly visible and inconspicuous, omnipresent, yet theoretically forbidden. They were crafted by people at the bottom of the social and political hierarchies that organized the early modern Portuguese world, yet objects of universally recognized and feared power. In this regard, the bolsas make apparent how the definition of the nature and source of power and beyond this its exercise were embattled fields in Portugal and its overseas protection, even if the Portuguese state and church claimed them as their prerogative. The bolsas put to work for their owners invisible forces to visible results, or in other words, the exercise power define the ability to mobilize immaterial means to achieve material results. As such, they threatened and engendered the wrath of church and state alike. The two institutions consequently strive to neutralize them. The Inquisition decreed mandating denunciation of their users and the inquiries that ensued were attempts to tame the empowered object. The Holy Office's proceedings transformed the bolsas into evidence and inert archival remains in their files, while discursively reframing the supernatural transactions that went into their making and use as devil-inspired and actionable offenses. Inquisition officers shackled the bolsas and the power they held within paper bundles sealed with wax. They stitched and bound the bags between the pages of trial records and reframed them with legal and religious formulae inscribed in ink on paper. In other words, in order to assuage its anxieties about their disruptive powers, the Inquisition turned to gestures of performative catharsis and acts of symbolic accumulation strikingly similar to that at the core of the objects it fought. Parallel reckonings about the shape and form of power and the means to control it emerge in other parts of the Atlantic beyond the Portuguese-speaking world. Men and women of African origins or descent living under the colonial rule of France in the Caribbean, Caribbean island of Saint-Domingue, for instance, composed and sold in the mid-18th century empowered packets of similar makeup and function at the Bolsas de Manjinga. The French archives holds records describing such packets known under the, under the name of Gadco or Macondal. Gadco, Macondal. And once preserved some of them as evidence. As in Portugal, interest in or anxieties about the bundles boiled over in the decades around the middle of the 18th century. At the time, European authorities witnessed the efficacious manipulation of invisible forces by Africans through the bundles and resolved to better understand and contravene the presence, instruments, and nature of their powers. As in the Portuguese world, the material and spiritual complexes that shook Saint-Domingue gained a specific name, in this case, that of Macondal. The term associated the bundles to François Macandal, an African-born man who had escaped slavery and became a notorious spiritual and political leader. He faced trial in 1758 for something for sorry for fomenting a widespread revolt associated with the death by poison of white planter, cattle, and slaves. Condemned to burn at the stake as befitted a criminal who used poison by means of magic, he transitioned on the pyre from rebel to mythical hero 
as, as he escaped the flames twice. Once in front of an odd crowd, uh, he untied his restraint and jumped out of the fire. A second time, away from the view of onlookers whom French authorities had dispersed out of caution, he flew away from the stick in his new form of a fly. And this is a portrait of Macondal by uh, contemporary Asian artist Edouard Duval Carrier. When used in 18th century, century Saint-Domingue, the term Macondal referred to a type of objects African composed and used to effect agency over their lived circumstances. Packets, mixing ingredients tied together with coating, strings, and knots. Africans on the islands crafted many superstitious and innocuous packets, um, the French observers noted. But some were different, for they held redoubtable powers, and these were Macondal. The word Macondal thus emerged in the 18th century in parallel to the term Manjinga, as similar neologisms used to describe a kind of specific Afro-Atlantic potency and a material object crafted and used to channel and direct it. Sébastien Jacques Courtin, the French judge in charge of pro prosecuting François Macandal, tells us more. He penned a memorandum that starts on the right page there, shortly after the trial and execution of 1758, detailing the information that he gathered during the proceeding and his take on the whole affair. The report opens with a chilling realization. The inexplicably frequent illnesses and death of white and black islanders in the preceding years that the French had attributed to tropical climate and disease, in fact, had been poisonings perpetrated by enslaved and marooned Africans. The poisonings, he explained, operated in concert with the making and selling of packets, bundling ingredients from herbs to human bones and Catholic sacra into tied, knotted, and anointed bundles. A mastermind stood at the center of the nefarious plot, François Macandal. The trials and inquests surrounding the activity of the fomenters and his associates opened the eyes of Courtin and others in the French establishment. For a very long time, Courtin explained, and I quote him, we have scorned all the superstition of the neg, the gadka, their fetishes, and the rest that the whites have regarded as a consequence of their idolatry and of their blindness in which they dwell. End of quote. Now, they knew that these packets led to all crimes. Granted, some of the amulets, am, am, amulets Africans used were vain superstitions, but others, however, operated in the realm of magic and their poison was all too real. Those, Quotin writes, are Macondal. The Caribbean judge approached Macondal through his own observation of bundles and interrogation of practitioners paired with the religious and legal guidelines that directed France's judicial approach to poison, the Edict of 1682. The French jurisprudence, a watershed moment in France's religious and legal history, denied the existence of witchcraft. Instead, it condemned the practices and objects it once labeled as, once labeled as um, witchcraft as critical offenses under the rubric of sacrilege and classified them as dangerous crimes and gateways to poisoning, either pharmacological or magical. Macandal, Courtin accordingly explained, were double offenses. First, they were sacrilegious and profane because their makeup called upon Catholic paraphernalia. Second, they function as or in association, association with poisons. By themselves, Macondal can make one strong in combat, give success in gambling, protect against beatings from slave masters, make the masters blind to his slave's activities, and soften his heart. They can also help in romantic affairs. <laughs> 
but they can also use cause all sorts of damages and direct hatred and harm toward the victim. And to kill or to render ill, they operated along with the administration of wanga or poison. Macondal, in other words, lent to Africans in Saint-Domingue power to act upon their lived circumstances individually and collectively. Thus, Courtin concluded, we, that is to say the French colonial administration, we must take every measure to stop them. The bundles effectively bound together French anxieties of a slave agency and the hopes of the enslaved to seize control over their lives. This bond manifested itself in Courtin's memorandum, albeit in a very different manner from the Inquisition's treatment of the Bolsas de Mendinga that it tied, stitched, and noted between the pages of its own paper, paper packets. The ties and knots that bond Courtin's memorandum to Macandal, materially and spiritually, are metaphorical, but just as tight. Literary historian Monique Alverts has suggested that the memorandum, in fact, formed a Macandal of its own, establishing indexical connections between its signs, in this case, alphabetic writing, and the material conditions of its making. And I do see the multiple connections. Courtin's manuscript tied together French juridical practices and modes of recording with the material conditions of the colony that also gave rise to the packets. We see, for instance, ink seeping from one side of the page to the other because of Caribbean humidity, but also as a result of attempts at clarifying his testimony and reconciling Afro-Atlantic practices and metropolitan religious terminology and jurisprudence. So I'm referring here to um, this asterisk here that seeps to the other side. Um, this is the same page in recto and verso. The pages also loop together the multiple voices that spoke in the multilingual face-to-face -face that took place between Courtin and the condemned men and women he interrogated in a mix of French, Creole, and African languages. Bundled, too, are epistemological differences between accusers and defendants, melded together in a report that may seem full of contradictions, but in fact bear witness to what Courtin considered a satisfying, complete, and coherent account of the material, spiritual, and social practices of Macandal. The French judge tied together multiple material, spiritual, and intellectual strands into a new, fully realized Creole whole that was his report. Tellingly, his contemporaries violently criticized the memorandum as vulgar, superstitious, and degraded, an opinion that I think measures well the distance between Courtin's report, cum macandal, and what would be a flat, linear, metropolitan perspective on the same material. Ultimately, the concern of the Portuguese and French authorities and their engagement at a formal and abstract level with the bundles only underline the objects firm place in European and American societies, a success derived from their ostensible ambiguity and position at the intersection of European and non-European material and magical religious cultures. In their designs and contents, as we will discuss further tomorrow, the Bolsas and Macondal called upon and channeled, almost exclusively in the case of the Bolsas, European esoteric materials and symbols. Yet Portuguese and Africans turned to the Bolsas as potent complements or substitutes to European amulets. And clients had particular faith, as already mentioned, in the special efficacy of those who had recently journeyed across the Atlantic. The Macondal likewise emerged in ceremonies and mixed ingredients closely tied to the rites, sacra, and spoken incantations of Catholicism. Yet they lend to their African makers and users powers of a new kind. Finding 
mixing and activating ingredients and symbols gathered in Europe or the Americas, manchingueros or specialists in Macondal crafted amulets of Afro-Atlantic agency. They created with their bundles sites of cross-cultural combination and creative reinventions through which they pondered about, reckoned with, and reinvented in both concrete and abstract ways the form, meaning, and nature of power, as well as the modes of mobilizing it. In turn, their material and spiritual interventions prompted European religious and civil authorities to mount a spirited response. They arrested amulet makers, seized their empowered packets, archived their spiritual and material transactions in a set of actions, reflections, and material constructions that echoed and extended that of the bundles. The authorities may or may not have succeeded in controlling the Afro-Atlantic forces the bundles unleashed, but their actions and reactions effectively demonstrated and broadened, uh, demonstrated how, sorry, the bundles broadened European conception of the numinous and understandings of the shape of power. Thank you. Do you want this? Uh, thank you hugely. That was absolutely fascinating. And um, you took us on such a journey through materials and uh, geographically. Um, I'm going to ask you a Dahomey question in part because there's so much of this that resonates. Yes. Um, so I think a cut one, one, there's such close similarity with Bo mm -hmm. in the sense of these po empowered materials. And sometimes there as well, one would create a packet with the requirements that are largely made by a diviner to put together in this context. So my first question is, do we have any sense of whether there were specialists who were intervening in this in some way and were these particular individuals and were they taking recourse in something equivalent to what we would say is divination, fa, ifa, otherwise? Um, secondly, the the Mandinga as a term is kind of interesting to me, of course, because the Portuguese are going <laughs> earliest into that area of Senegal. And there you've got the longstanding legacy of the Koran in leather, which speaks to an interesting complement that is then changed. But I'm wondering if in the use of the uh, written language, as in the first example from Lisbon, if this speaks in part to different audiences in Lisbon that are being invoked, for lack of a better word, then, for example, in Haiti, um, where, I mean, these are certainly stories, accounts that one hears also about Toussaint Louverture and the ability to um, uh, protect one from gunfire, et cetera. So I'm wondering about whether or not one could read that. And, and I'm wondering, as I was looking at the imagery, the, the, for lack of a better word, the figural designs, I was thinking about the closest Dahomey, I mean, there are also some Congo compliments probably, but the closest Dahomey ones were the kinds of offerings or va that are made uh, with, um, certainly since the 16th century with corn flour, but others in front of particular shrines. So mm -hmm. it made me wonder, and you've got the, what would be if I were gonna read that from a Dahomey, um, so the palm friends are used to kind of um, create patterns with the, corn in the mm -hmm. soil. And I'm wondering to what extent some of these are sort of double, triple references to kind of offerings, different audiences, and uh, and anything that might speak to the ability of these individuals to actually um, address specific concerns for an individual rather than the more generic ones. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so partly, um, you, you've sort of out outlined the next two lectures, um, so that's a <laughs> that's a nice uh, uh, preview. Um, but I think what I what I can answer specifically without kind of referring to what we'll talk more about uh, tomorrow and the day after um, is that yes, absolutely, there are connections and there are resonances, uh, and I think they are important 
Not um, so much because it allows us to understand the bolsas, for example, but because it allows us to set um, a, a map of the kinds of manipulations, visual and material, that uh, are being implemented in that particular moment of the early 18th century, but the 18th century at large. And I think taking that view um, gives us a better understanding of both sides or all sides at the same time, uh, rather than trying to kind of pinpoint a one-way tra transmission from one side to the other. Um, and what I'm arguing uh, in, in these lectures is that um, it is all happening at the same time. And in fact, the terrain in which it's happening is the slave trade. Um, and Europeans are involved as much as uh, Africans from coast coastal uh, Atlantic locations and enslaved Africans in the Americas or Europe for that matters. Um, they all involve together in creating that numinous world that is activated through a range of techniques, some of which are European, some of which are Vodun, some of which are Congo. Uh, and you can pinpoint which are which, but what's particularly interesting is to see the fluidity between them all and how they come together to create um, solutions that are so efficacious and so easy to recognize for everybody. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Fascinating oh. talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering how you understand these bolsas um, in relationship to other kinds of similar objects of power, or um, such as those that were buried in the earth or placed in doorways, or also um, similar concoctions of like grave dirt and these kinds of things that were actually imbibed. Um, in oaths and other other um, rituals in the Atlantic world. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so part of the answer is is a question of um, specialty and training. That I'm I'm very much a you know scholar of the Af uh, African Portuguese uh, side uh, of things, and so I start with the bolsas. Um, and I, in this particular set of uh, uh, studies, I bring in Saint Domingue kind of as a complement. Um, to it uh, to widen the circle. But I do think that uh, if we were to look, and I have looked a little bit, but not to the extent of uh, presenting it as part of the study uh, to conjure or other Caribbean manifestations. And I do think that uh, uh, absolutely they are taking part in a similar process. Um, and what I hope is that once this project is put together, it is able to um, extend or to give a better understanding of other modes of, um, uh, you know, of the manifestation of control of numinous powers by enslaved uh, all over the, uh, the Americas. And what I'm suggesting at the end is that, you know, instead of looking to the Portuguese world or to the French colonial empire or the British colonial empire, if we look at the Afro-Atlantic as a space of its own, then we recognize connections that we may miss uh, otherwise because of the historiography and because of the um, different types of approach in the archives um, that may not be evident. Thank you. Cecile, thank you for your multilingual presentation. Can you talk a little bit more about the use of Latin in Afro-Atlantic spirituality? We know it's used in Catholicism to tap into different realms. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, um, I can tell you that they, uh, uh, in the case of the Bolsas, um, the prayers that we have written, sometimes they're in Latin, sometimes they're in something between Portuguese and Latin, but I think they're meant to um, capture uh, esoteric <laughs> language, right? Uh, and the documents in the Spanish Inquisition also have prayers in Latin, and some of them are already printed, the kind of, you know, prayer sheets that would be circulating that are, you know, appropriated and put into these packets. Um, so there is a real understanding that there is a particular power to that language uh, and its association with, um, I think, 
uh, the process of saying mass that would be in Latin and that uh, uh, gives power to the object. So for example, the bow says, one of the mendingueros tell us that to be very efficient, it has to be placed on the altar and three masses have to be said over it. So there is that very clear understanding that there is some particular potential there. Um, but it is one among many others that are being put together. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I had the opportunity to read this paper uh, as a peer reviewer for the journal, which is going to be published. And is it out yet? <laughs> Not the same paper, though. OK, no, I understand that. But anyway, <laughs> let's say the proto version. So um, I, I, I love to write footnotes. But when reading Cecile's paper, I didn't have to look up footnotes. I knew exactly where she was getting everything she said. And as I was reading through this paper, I kept seeing the connections. Wow, I hadn't seen that. Wow, I hadn't seen that. Wow, I hadn't seen that. I have to say, this is the most amazing paper I've read in my 42 years as an academic. Um, and and as an homage to you. Now, I have a little question, too, a technical question. <laughs> <laughs> so how, how do we get exact? Uh, you seem to imply that, that Makandala and Mandinga are, are somehow the same. Uh, how do you get from that linguistic turn from the two, one to the other? Or are you doing that? Yeah, I, I'm not suggesting that there's the same, but that they're definitely related. And, um, and it's something we'll talk more about uh, tomorrow and the day after, that what I find very compelling is that you can interpret one with the tools of interpretation you would develop for the other. And so that creates, oops, that creates a, f a fluidity and an overlap that then we have to reckon with that you know, if one works as the other could work, and they're involving people that came or could have come from the same place um, around the same time, and it's just a matter of which ship you ended up being embarked on, right? Um, so it's really mapping a really capacious um, uh, network of spiritual solutions that are being, uh, um, being implemented there. Um, and I kind of take it as a first step of deconstruction, because so much effort has gone into identifying um, what all these designs were, for example. There are scholars that would say they're obviously Vodun, other scholars think they're obviously Congo. Um, but I think they, it doesn't matter at the end. They can be both. They probably were a little bit of both. But what matters is that there is a more capacious, vast way of thinking about them and um, uh, understanding them. And that tells us that there was a more, more capacious way of formulating them, too. And that's what I'm interested in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cecile, for this wonderful presentation. Um, my question has to do with your discussion about the ambiguity uh, uh, of the amulets um, mm -hmm. compared to the scapulars. I wanted to know if you found in uh, your research in the archive any cases of uh, Africans uh, who have been detained uh, uh, wearing amulets and being accused of witchcraft, but um, defending themselves, in fact, uh, stating perhaps that these are not actually amulets, but that they are scapulars. Given yeah, that I, I, I want to say all of them at the, <laughs> at the beginning. Uh, it's probably not true, but yes, that's definitely a trope that is being used uh, at the time. Um, and it's one that is very well understood. Uh, and for example, in the case that I brought, uh, I brought up uh, for, uh, oops, sorry, this particular packet, it is described um, in the accusation, uh, in the delation, as, oh, this is a scapular, but in fact, it's not a scapular. It has, um, you know, unorthodox things inside of it. And I think you should look at it as a menjinga. Uh, and of course, uh, as a defense, they were saying, no, 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 it's an orthodox scapular. Uh, and so that fluidity is exactly what they were worried about and what they were um, manipulating and kind of uh, using as a, um, as a hinge to multiply the powers of these kinds of objects. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I have a question. You mentioned earlier, well, you mentioned that the French wanted to stamp out 
these Makandala, I think, Macandala. because they, because they um, saw them as giving enslaved people agency mm-hmm. over their life, which sort of implies a more nefarious sort of reason to want to stamp them out. But is it, is it, was that the same with the Portuguese? Was it strictly a religious concern that, oh, they're practicing witchcraft, or was their sort of reasoning more sort of nefarious also? Yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, you're correct. It's never only a religious concern. It only becomes a problem because the um, spiritual dimension of these objects threaten the social order. And that's when they bubble to the surface and become uh, something that the Inquisition, which is very much an arm of the civil government also, uh, is um, uh, looking into them. So they are dangerous because they're efficacious um, and uh, their efficacy threatens that um, monopoly of um, power that uh, the church and state of Portugal should have, but they realize that they don't have it. So um, thank you, Cecile, for your great talk. So my question is, um, why did enslaved people want to borrow symbols from Catholicism? What was it about these symbols that perhaps was appealing? Was it because of the power dynamic? Oh. You know, there's this unequal power dynamic, so perhaps there's something to these? Or is it that the symbols can sort of transfer and sort of flow between all different cultural boundaries? And then also, if you look at the amulets, um, the surface, the ones that you showed with the diagrams and the writing, I see also Islamic amulets there. So I wonder if Islam can't kind of go into the mix, because Islamic amulets have the little squares all over and some Mm -hmm. of the sort of two-dimensional designs as well. And there's really no figurative art there whatsoever. So it makes me think of that. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think the, and we'll talk about it more um, uh, tomorrow and the day after, uh, but the answer uh, that is basic and really true is that they were using these designs because they worked, because they were efficacious. And very much what is at play there is a dialectic of attack and counterattack. And the playing field is shared between Europeans and Africans, and so they're using the same tools uh, by and large. Um, now the question uh, for about the uh, Islamic dimension, um, it is one that's curious and that's uh, important is that in that particular moment of the 18th century, there is no direct um, Islamic amulets used by the Africans in the Portuguese world. Uh, before in this early 17th century, we see them during that moment, they all look like this very Catholic inspired. And then later on in the 19th century, the Islamic amulets come back. And there is that temporality there. Now. Let me see. Up. Um, Could you say that, do that sequence again? Uh, early 17th century, they were around. 18th century. They were around, they were Catholic. No, they were Islamic. Oh, yeah, they the were Islamic also. amulets are around. In the 18th century, as far as I can tell from the records, in particular of the Inquisition, uh, that tells us about these objects, they are not prominent. And they make, um, they explain very carefully that although they're called Menjinga, which is uh, an area that is related to uh, the rule of Islam on the African continent, they are not um, Islamic. And then in the 19th century with the Malay rebellion, etc., same similar kinds of objects come back uh, into play in Brazil. And the etymology of the word is from the French? Um, the Menjinga from uh, Malinke, Men- Mandingo. No, it's it's a it's a, a Portuguese um, version of uh, people of Mali, people of Mandan. So it's Portuguese. It is Portuguese. So yeah. It's not an African word. It's a Portuguese description of an African people. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. The Spanish one too. Yeah. Mandingo. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering why they disappear in the 18th century. Maybe we don't didn't find the evidence. Yeah. No. It's the it's a it's. On the one hand, it is an argument by absence, which is, you know, what it is. But on the other hand, um, I think given the concern of the Inquisition with uh, crypto Jews and uh, at that time, not so much crypto Muslims, but that would be something that would have called their attention. And that brings me back to uh, uh, Cynthia's question about the Islamic dimension that could still be there by and large. Um, And I think partly, 
is that there is kind of a common beaker uh, that comes before that moment in, uh, in which esoteric traditions in Portugal are very much Islamic inspired um, or Jewish inspired to some extent, um, as they were for a large, uh, uh, large areas of Atlantic Africa. So that those designs probably resonated or at least could resonate with that dimension. And uh, a specific example has to do with the um, coins, amulets that would be worn. Uh, some of them were Moroccan coins uh, with the stars. These were very good amulets worn in Portugal. So the connection is there, um, but it's not specific to what these are um, doing. And their emphasis is very much on the Catholic prayers and on the Catholic dimension. Thank you. Um, is this on? Um, I, I wondered about um, those black Madonnas that are in Europe under lock and cover. Um, you showed some other um, figures. Um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't get exactly. Yes, their let, me, let me go back to the virgins, yeah. Right. Well, no, right before oh, that. Oh, sorry, I see something different here. So okay, yeah. yeah. There we go. So I wondered if uh, some of the black Madonnas had some of those similar, had anything similar to that. Hmm, that's. Um, well, the black Madonnas are under lock and key. You can see them all over, right? Yes, uh, I think they, they take part in, a, in probably a different story. Um, they are the ones I can think of. Um, in uh, Burgundy, for example, are much older in terms of the particular uh, devotion that are uh, given to them. Um, and so what's interesting with these uh, particular, which are Our Lady of Mercy, is that they are transferred from Iberia to the Americas, uh, and an emphasis is given to their relationship with enslavement and liberation. So I think that is uh, the, the point that is being um, uh, emphasized, n not very, in a very subtle way in this case, right, with like this big change. Um, so I think that's what we should focus on with these particular examples. Yeah, thank you. Um, Cecile, I don't know, is this on? Yeah. Uh, this is a fabulous talk, and it's it's developed so much since we heard it, I think, in the same room about two years ago. Yes. Right? What is really so exciting about this to me is that you really are doing a multilateral emergent history. So it's not a linear history, even although the linear dimensions feed into it. And what you so show so beautifully is the way the reciprocal logic passes back and forth, so that what is supernatural you know, in, uh, on one side, you know, becomes mundane on the other, but in the process of making it mundane, you actually add to its exoticism or its power. So I wondered about why, for obvious reasons it would seem, you're avoiding the idea of the fetish, right? Even though it comes mm -hmm. up in your material. Yes, and I, I mean the fetish now, not only in the sense, you know, not in the sense of the historical right. denunciation, but the William Peets mm -hmm. et al. And what's interesting about that notion is that it's multi lateral. It, it moves back and forth. It's a prism in terms of which one side looks at the other yeah, to condemn, but in the process is being remade. Yeah? And each side is both incorporating and drawing lines anew. Yeah? So that there's a really sort of complex reciprocal process emerging that is, has many sides to it. Did you avoid that term? No, I, yes, yes, I did. And tell us uh, why. For purely rhetorical reasons, because I uh, take it on in the third part of the, um, of the lectures, um, in which I very much talk about that history. And um, uh, I will argue how this example is actually uh, challenging these ideas of um, the fetish. And, what uh, it is and how it has framed our understanding of a certain number of uh, practices. Um, and I'm taking a you know, gentle uh, stab at Pete's and his uh, series of articles that are you know, old now, older. Um, but I think it has everything to do with it. Um, but we, to put it in a different light, uh, I wanted to set up uh, a, a robust amount of context um, to get there um, in a couple of days. Well, it seems to be we're still fetishized by the fetish ourselves in our discourse. <laughs> Absolutely. All the time, right? Yes, yes. 
Sir. Cecile. Yes. Uh, uh, well, two, one comment and then two, uh, mm -hmm. que a related question. Uh, the order of, of mercy is a Spanish order. Uh, Pedro Nolasco establishes it, and that's when uh, the Virgin of Mercy actually takes on the attribute of the chains because she exists prior to uh, that as a, as a virgin. But when she becomes a virgin of mercy, she is the redemptor of slavery. But those are Spanish slaves that are captured mm -hmm. uh, in Africa who are then ransomed. Uh, so the, it is a multiple, multiple uh, image uh, about slavery uh, in that sense. But my question really is about the archive and when something becomes the subject of the archive. Because not all practices become the focus and subject of archival and inquisitorial uh, investigation. And so the question then becomes not about scapularies, but that the Spanish and the Portuguese also have, and this may be in the third lecture, but I won't be here, so <laughs> I'm gonna ask the question, is that they also wear amulets. And you see amulets depicted, especially around the waist of uh, children such as Prince Balthazar, they're painted. And these are amulets that are not Catholic, but actually are amulets that contain magical uh, elements. And so the amulet becomes, in this case, both uh, a positive and a negative within that culture going across. And this is like Jean's question, is that it is an ambivalent object in and of itself because it operates in both, but it can be used as a stigmatizing one if it is engañado, if it is a deceptive amulet. And there it takes on the negative because they're commensurate in terms of an ontological category. But then when you move into the operative, they become distinct and they can be used and therefore, I think, become the subject of inquiry at the inquisitorial level. Yes, absolutely. I think the, the two categories that I'm looking at um, are, on the one hand, power and trying to understand its makeup and the ways in which it can be mobilized and put to work in that context of the Afro-Atlantic. And on the other end, which goes with it is the legitimacy of power, so to speak, right? And in what context, under what political condition it is or it is not legitimate. And putting these two together is how we can write that history of the Afro-Atlantic, spiritually and materially. And that's a history that I think still remains too elusive because the kinds of power and the moments when or the conditions under which it is legitimate or not um, have not been considered through that diagonal, but they've been considered through um, the imperial histories, for example. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is really fascinating. Um, I just want to follow up on this question, and you talked a lot about the power of the object. And the object have the ability to uh, be a shield uh, to protect you know, the carrier or a weapon to kind of throw, some lady used the word witchcraft, so to speak. You are a researcher. Mm -hmm. How do you handle such a powerful piece of material? Do you have to wear special gloves or <laughs> get yourself, <laughs> uh, you know, whatever you have to do to protect yourself from the object, the, the power of the object? Lead, yes. Lead, like kryptonite. That's right, yeah, with a, with a shield. Um, well, I, I, you know, ask for help from the ancestors to kind of look over me while I'm doing it. Uh, and it's a great question. In some cases, in particular in museum context, these objects have been treated with all sorts of uh, conservative material arsenic. Uh, it was a popular one, so you probably should wear gloves, uh, not for their sake, but for yours, absolutely. Um, on, on a related kind of side of the story, um, there is uh, also an, kind of an interesting evolution from when I started looking at those 10 years, 15 years ago, and now that back in the days, um, they weren't digitized, they weren't photographed, so you could actually see the actual objects, go to the archive and ask for them, um, and kind of, you know, 
unfold the things and look through it. Um, now, because it is digitized, right, because you can see the flat image of it, uh, the archivists are um, less uh, amicable to showing you the actual thing. So that's another way in which you know, their powers are still being controlled, right, uh, for reasons um, uh, having to do with that legitimacy of what they're doing. Yeah, thank you. Five, but they're also 500 years old. You know, we don't want people to touch them, right? Well, people, you know, it's not like crowds well, going for the, the Portuguese archives. Art historians at Yale, for example, <laughs> should be uh, exempted. What is the, I, I can't tell, is there someone with their hand up before me, behind you? No, I think you could. Okay. Um, what, what, what is the, uh, this is going to sound like a simple question. The subtext of this, you know, nobody's jumping out of a fire twice <laughs> or uh, jumping on a sword, blah, 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 you know, it didn't happen. So what's the, no, <laughs> sorry. What's the, you could say, it's obvious to say what work is being done it's like Africans flying home, like Ebo landing, mm -hmm. and you know ways to get out of impossible. Or it's like you're dead for three days and you rise again, right? This is not every people have. What'd you say? <laughs> what did she say? I couldn't hear. I didn't hear either. In theory. In theory. In theory. Yeah, right. No? In theory. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying they're miraculous deliverance tales. Yeah. It's a, there are miraculous deliverance tales. It's a genre. Mm -hmm. um, have you thought about the history of these in relationship to miraculous delivery? Yes, thank you. I think it's more mundane than that and perhaps more interesting because of it that um, these testimonies about their efficacy are in, in, in many ways uh, very, you know, just funny. Like you shooting on a dog, uh, for example. Um, but it really talks to the concern, in particular, of people who feel like they should not believe in it. Uh, and it's often testimonies by Europeans um, who are invested by their position. It's a captain in the army. It is um, somebody that, is a, a prom that has a prominent administrative job saying, you won't believe me. And I, won't, I don't believe myself that I believe that these objects have agency. Mm -hmm. And they are coming up with examples, with anecdotes, and with proof as a point of method about the ways in which they can certify that these objects are efficacious. Mm -hmm. And that underlines their importance and the importance of the powers they are mobilizing in the formation of the Atlantic, both in the European realm and the African realm, and that, in fact, both the realms are only one, and they're um, operating in concert. And I think that's what I'm particularly interested in there, that their powers is recognized by everybody, and as such, creates a ripple effect on what the social makeup of that world um, had to be and the form that it took in a way that then we forgot about or the archive or the historiography forgot about because of the history of colonialism that comes afterwards and that orders things very neatly between um, the irrational and the rational, the European and the African um, in a way that we tend to bring retrospectively to the 18th century and earlier and these examples show that it was not the case. But we're burning witches in Salem in the 17th century, right? Yep. So, and well, yeah, well, I, I know I'm, I'm on a board of a foundation that was created, uh, Daniel Rose's foundation. It's got a, a horrible title, the Helping Africa Foundation, but it exists to fight witchcraft, uh, the, for, to fight the fight against so-called witchcraft throughout, starting in Ghana, uh, as a matter of fact. So I'm... I'm going back to when I was a graduate student, I had to read Keith Thomas's Religion and the Decline of Magic. You know, that was a long time ago. Um, and I'm just interested in, you, in a way, the more footnotes about how powerful these things are from Europeans, the less powerful it makes me think they really are. Mm. So I'm interested in why a collective 
the need to believe not only among black people but non-black people not only among the subjugated but the subjugate tours mm -hmm. again what work this the idea that there is magic that has to be contained right yep. and that you can kill the possessor of the magic what larger social work is that doing in the the, the great order of things is intriguing uh yes I, I absolutely um you know, in a way, to answer the um, the question, to bring something to the conversation, um, is to to think again about the example in Saint Domingue that is happening um, in the aftermath of that uh, edict of 1682 uh, that comes in France after the famous uh, uh, affair of the poisons at the court of Louis XIV, um, where all sorts of uh, aristocrats are embroiled in a poisoning scheme for political reasons. Um, and uh, basically... They're trying, they, 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 I don't know about that. Who are they trying to poison? Oh. The king? <laughs> No, not the king, but their political rivals. Oh, okay. uh, and the mistress of the king is one of the main uh, characters in the story. It's very, uh, both a very glamorous and chilling um, uh, moment. Uh, dozens of people are arrested eventually. Does anybody die? <laughs> yeah. Really? Their people are poisoned uh, and die, and people are seized and executed too. Um, but the, because it's um, um, the people that are really in the close circle of Louis XIV are involved, um, the resolution at the time, and the time was ripe for it, uh, had to be that it wasn't witchcraft. It was pharmacological poisoning or magical poisoning, but it was not witchcraft because the mistress of the king cannot be a witch. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so the edict is... Uh, if you kill her, he'll kill you. Right. right. <laughs> Something along those lines. Um, and so the edict is clarifying this, saying now in France there is no more witchcraft. Witchcraft does not exist okay. legally. Um, and of course... However, the amulets <laughs> exist. However, you can have poisoning you can have sacrilege, meaning using Catholic paraphernalia not for Catholic reasons, and you can have poisoning, and poisoning can be either pharmacological or magical. So magical poisoning still exists, but it's not witchcraft, which is an important point. And if you go to the colonies, for, um, for decades, even though the edict had happened, they continued to burn uh, enslaved ritual specialists as witches up until basically the moment of Macandal, where they have to reconcile what is happening politically uh, in that moment and the full powers of French order. And at that moment, even though they have more proof that it functions as what they would think of as witchcraft, they officially decide, Courtin is the main judge there, to bring in the Edict of 1682 and saying, so this is not witchcraft. It is poisoning, and we are prosecuting the enslaved ritual practitioners as poisoners. Mm. And they are trying to control, again, the narrative, you know, as we would say in uh, current politics, right, um, in diminishing, perhaps, or yes. changing the perspective right. on the powers that are at play in a way that makes them more uh, easier to control. Right, like uh, dethroning the supernatural, right? You, to some extent, yeah. Right, and saying, to the extent that you can do it in the 18th century context, they are not, you know, throwing the baby with the bathwater. Right, but they're saying these are. This is created by human beings who were just mean, and they use a chemical, and it's called a poison, and this doesn't have anything to do with the devil or God or anything else. Not exactly. Okay. These are created by human beings who right. are evil, and they are created either through pharmacological means, mm -hmm. or or both magical means, and magical means that are made efficient by the devil. Oh, OK. okay. So but it's not witchcraft. Uh, I got you. So the supernatural is still there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, got you. OK. Emmanuel. Yeah, may I? Just a, a quick follow-up. I, I thank you also for a, you. a really wonderful uh, a talk. So, so there's a sense in which uh, both has become uh, an object that the Inquisition inquires into. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they have moved from superstition. Uh, they've looked at criminality. Uh, 
But now they've gone beyond that to say there's something spiritually malevolent about what is going on. Uh, at some point in time, you mentioned the uh, three uh, Hail Marys were said. Mm -hmm. but, but there's a sense in which they are dealing with spirituality. And, and, and I'm not assuming there's an implicit faith that the Catholic thing would trump this. So if you could speak to, there must have been a, a phase of anxiety, ambivalence, what do we do with this? And the ritual processes by which these objects were denuded or disempowered. If you can, is there any evidence of this in the archival record? Mm -hmm. And when do inquisitors become positive and certain that we know how to disempower this? Yes, thank you very much. Um, these are great questions, and we know some of the answers and not all of them. Um, so there are two different contexts there. So the Portuguese context is within the Inquisition. Um, and there, by and large, they are um, looking into the bolsas, they're concerned about it, but they're really, you know, not that concerned. Like the main concern of the Portuguese Inquisition at the time is still crypto Judaism. That's really what they're looking at. The thousands and thousands of codexes are about that. And then there is a few about these objects that bubble to the surface because they create disorder. And it seems from um, the trials, uh, from the records, and from the fact that they're putting it within those codexes that they think that doing this is enough to control their powers. And I think reframing them within the orthodoxy that they represent, right? Uh, that this becomes inert. You can open the papers, put them flat, stitch them in the record, and you know the problem is solved. The uh, amulet makers in the Portuguese um, uh, world are condemned to forced labor, um, uh, public confessions. They are not often executed um, because they feel pretty confident that they've got that. In the French um, uh, context in Saint-Domingue, it's a different, um, it's a different uh, uh, power dynamics in that they start with this great anxiety about people dying by the thousands. By, and they think they don't know why. Um, and we, after years and years, that affair of Macandal comes to the surface, and they finally have a reason why these people were dying. And it was because of Macandal, which by itself is not a poison, but it operates with poison. And so they're solving that problem there. They execute Macandal, the execution is botched, he escapes, no one believes he dies um, because he had predicted himself that he was not going to die, so people believe him. Um, and so in a way, they are um, finding a solution to a narrative that had already uh, begun. And in another way, a lot of historians, and I think uh, uh, rightly, are seeing that moment as a precursor to you know, the rest of the story of Haiti in the 18th century that leads to emancipation. It is one of um, uh, th this moment where uh, the slavery system is made vulnerable and is admitting its vulnerability, and one of the blows that will um, end with uh, the liberation of the enslaved on the island. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, that's a Chicago amount of question. Is that okay? Sure. Um, I, I was really struck, um, and something sort of clicked for me when you used the phrase spiritual solution to talk about these, how um, these different cultures um, were in contact with one another, would arrive at the same spiritual solution. Um, and I was wondering if, with respect to the actual um, sort of craft element, the material um, structure of these things, thinking about these as a spiritual solution lets you um, see differently what the problems were, right? I mean, we know the problems. Mm -hmm. How does looking at this thing in its particular materiality, um, does that have anything to say about um, ways of sort of the lived experience of the problem or which problem it was. I'm thinking about like the interiority of these things or um, the folding. 
Yeah, I think uh, one the principal way through which I started looking at these objects was thinking about power in uh, almost a kind of political science sort of uh, a view as you know the immaterial means to have material results, uh, and I thought that fit particularly well with his objects um, that are so material. And it's really easy to consider them only as material objects or um, uh, through the relationship between the material and the spiritual, uh, thinking of you know, their religious dimension, for example, as fetishes, for example. Um, but actually, what makes them so interesting and so um, eloquent in terms of understanding the period is that that materiality is very much related and is making possible uh, a, an array of um, implementation of power, right? And at the end, it is about the power. It is about the power that the Inquisition uh, is reacting against this object. It is about the power that the French um, civil uh, administration is reacting against this object. And I think quite obviously the enslaved practitioners are looking for power with this object. So I'm seeing it from that um, perspective. And then once that is set up, you can think about what are these immaterial means, right? Um, and what are the material results? And uh, psychological security is one of them, for, for sure. Um, um, but it is also coupled with physical integrity. And the two are very much related uh, in the way that you know, power and objects are related to each other, too. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Great. Well, join me in thanking Cecile. Thank you. Thank you, thank you.